Hey church, we're so glad you're joining us today. Remember to chat and connect with us while you watch or drop us a comment and just let us know how you're doing. When you're ready to join us in person, we'd love to see you. We still gather on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. and on Sunday mornings at 8.30 and 10 a.m. We're taking social distancing precautions and we offer a few different areas in our building where you can watch and maintain a safe distance. If you're new to Northeast, would you consider letting us know by heading to our website at northeastchristian.org and filling out a Connect card? While you're there, I highly encourage you to sign up for our Starting Point class. This is a one hour long class that will take place on February 7th at 1115. This class will help you understand what we're all about here at Northeast and what it means to follow Jesus. If you have a pastoral care need, please let us know. We would love to connect with you either in person or online. You can reach out to us by filling out a prayer request card on our website or by calling the church office. We are so excited to see the way that God is going to move in this service today. So let's worship together. Well, hello, Northeast. It's great to see you here today. Will you stand as we sing together? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes a whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless? This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be saved. I sing for all that you've done for me. Come on, let's put our hands together. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Oh, yeah. You would bear my cross.
Come on, let's lift a shout of praise.
shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken from my regard
can have a seat. Hello, church. Here at Northeast, every week that we gather, uh, we, uh, we share communion together. By doing so, we're remembering the, the most important part of our faith, that Jesus died for the, freedom, for the forgiveness of our sins, and that believing in Jesus and accepting that he died for our sins, we will have eternal life in heaven. It's an incredible gift, amen? As we eat this bread and we drink this juice, as Jesus himself directed us to do, um, we remember that his body and his blood were sacrificed for us. Jesus took the ultimate punishment in our place. And it's only by the grace of God's gift that we're saved. Our seemingly simple, seemingly human gesture of eating this small piece of bread and sipping this juice is actually no small thing at all. It has an incredibly big meaning. It represents the fulfillment of God's promise to us. So as we partake of communion, let's draw close to Jesus in this intimate remembrance of, this, of his sacrifice and thank our Heavenly Father for the gift of his Son. Church, I'm glad that we can gather together. I know that it's been an interesting season and an interesting start to a new year, but I'm grateful that we can gather together to worship and, uh, and celebrate this time together. Uh, I want to uh, welcome you, if this is your first time, to Northeast. If, if so, we'd invite you after the service to uh, make your way to Connect Central out in the lobby, out in the hallway. We'd love to just meet you and uh, answer any questions you might have and, and take some steps towards getting you connected here to the church and uh, for those, there are people gathering with us online as well, so we welcome them. Glad that they can join us through, through that technology. I do want to let you know, at the end of our service today, we are going to have a baptism right after, right after our closing, uh, uh, closing prayer. So Matt Kennedy with uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and uh, I'm, that's not his only identifier, but, uh, but Matt Kennedy is going to be baptized today. So excited, excited for that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, today, we are continuing this new year 
series called Living Your Best Life, and we're looking at what Scripture has to say about the topic. And uh, today, we, we've, I want to start out with this idea. Uh, most people, when asked, what do you want out of life, most people, when they get asked this question, uh, almost without, without a fault, will answer happiness. That's what they want out of life, happiness. Uh, there's a universal human learn, uh, yearning or wanting desire to be happy. So I, I just want to be happy. And I think a lot of people um, that, that connect this idea of happiness with what they want out of life, it, it becomes so important to them that it, be kind of, it, it kind of becomes a measurement of right or wrong. Like uh, if, it, if it makes me happy, then it can't be that bad, Right? Anybody remember that song? No? If it makes you happy, then, then it can't be wrong. It's got to be, it's got to be okay. So often though, I think, I think Christians will take this idea of happiness and they will merge it with their faith and they will come up with this idea that, well, God just wants me to be happy. So I want to ask you that question. What do you think? Does, does God want you to be happy? Now, before you maybe vocally answer that, I'd love to give you just a little bit of, of uh, well, a few things to think about. In uh, the years that I've been involved in ministry, and, and that's not too many years, but uh, maybe you can track with me here, oftentimes when someone comes to me and says, you know, God just wants me to be happy, usually, almost always, it's, it's because they're considering something really stupid. So... Uh, yeah. Now, I, I hate to break it to you, but oftentimes uh, uh, someone who is married will come to me and say, you know, Seth, God just wants me to be happy. And I'm, well, uh, not happy right now. And they're considering doing something really stupid uh, with their marriage or with their finances. You know, God just wants me to be happy. And I want to say, no, he doesn't. Stop it. <laughs> right? But then there are other times that people will come to me and they will say, you know, I, I just, I guess God just doesn't want me to be happy. And usually that statement is tied to some sort of tragedy or setback or difficulty in life. And I want to respond and say, you know what? Yes, God does want you to be happy. Get, get back up and get moving forward and remember what you know to be true. Show God that your faith is strong. Keep the faith. So which one is it? I mean, if, if someone says, you know, God wants me to be happy, and I'm like, no, no, he doesn't. And then, uh, you know, someone says, God just doesn't want me to be happy. And I say, yes, yes, he does. Which one is it? I mean, I want to disagree with, with each of them. I'm kind of torn. So does God want you to be happy? Yes. I do believe that God wants you to be happy. Of course he does. The song that we sang just a little while ago, God is a good, good father. What father does not want their children to be happy? What father doesn't want their child to be happy? So I think I can... I can very boldly say, God wants you to be happy. That is what he desires for you. Any of his children, you, me, any of his children, God desires for you, for, for me, for us to be happy. Now, I have said this from this stage before, but uh, I, I think I've been here long enough and I've shared enough words, um, probably thousands upon thousands of words that I'm hoping that I can reserve the right as I grow to occasionally mature and, and, and shift the way that I might say something. Because I know that I have said from this very stage, in probably the last five years, God doesn't want you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. Now that'll preach, right? I mean, that'll tweet, right? You can take that home. And I mean, God doesn't want you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. But the problem I have with that statement as I think about it a little bit more is, it's kind of bothersome to me. Because that takes holiness and happiness, and it puts them on opposite ends of the spectrum, and it says that you, you, know, you can't be happy and be holy at the same time, when in fact, here's the truth I want you to understand. God calls you to be holy, so you will be happy. When God calls you to be holy, it is because he wants you to be holy, so you will be happy. So I, I know that someone might be asking the question right now, well, where in Scripture does it say that God wants me to be happy? Well, we'll get to that a little bit later today. And I don't do this very often. I mean, if, you're, if you've been attending here or been a part of this church for very long at all, I do not do this very often. But in this case today, before I go to scripture, I, I want to go and talk a little bit about science. Now, in our household, one of my three children, whenever something, I won't tell you which one, but she just turned 13 this week. Um, <laughs> One of my feisty children, uh, when something exciting happens or, or, you know, a discovery is made or, 
uh, she likes to cook, and so she'll cook something, or we'll be talking about something, and, and, and something, I, I, I guess I'm struggling to find something to, to explain it, but all of a sudden, she will just blurt out, science, dad, and that's what, that's, you know, so she'll respond with, science, and like, like, well, two plus two, science, and I'm thinking, well, it's actually math, but, but you, you catch what I'm, I'm saying, that's kind of a phrase around our house with our youngest daughter, so I want to start with science. Look, before before God made it so that we have access to Scripture, the Bible, His Word, before God did that, He created the world for us to live in. And Scripture and the world, they do influence, influence us with the will and the way of God. So if you look at the way that you were created, the way that you were crafted, the way that God created you, you would never deny that God wants you to be happy. In fact, scientifically speaking, there are chemicals that God has put in your brain, chemicals that God has designed that we're going to talk about just for a little bit here that will lead you to happiness, chemicals of happiness. The first one that I want to mention to you, uh, statistically speaking, the ladies like this one is the chemical oxytocin. It's the comfort chemical. It's the when you get a warm embrace, you get a little drip of oxytocin. And you enjoy it. Uh, you get a pat on the back. You, get, you, you, you just enjoy that feeling, a firm handshake. You get a quick drip of oxytocin in your brain, and it does. It makes you feel good. So an older couple walking down the street, and they're holding hands. A little drip of oxytocin. Uh, 15-year-olds making out in the parking lot. Whoosh, a rush of oxytocin, if you catch my drift. So... It is, it is real, it is powerful, it, it is addicting, okay? So oxytocin helps you, it makes you happy. Dopamine is the next one I want to mention. This is the, the chemical in your brain that has to do with adventure. You skydive, you jump out of a perfectly good airplane, you're going to get a, a drip, just a quick drip of dopamine. If you're a hunter, the very first time that you put your, you know, a large animal on the ground, and you're kind of waiting for it to die, and you walk up on it, and you, you, you realize you have succeeded in harvesting an elk or, or a bear or something like that. You have got this, this dopamine going on, a mountain biker clearing a very technical trail for the first time. You get, a, you get this, this rush of dopamine. It drives you to achieve, to conquer, to be victorious. You type A folks in the room when you're doing your to-do list, and you're checking the boxes. Believe it or not, that is, a, that is a drip of dopamine in that moment. The next chemical I want to mention, the third one is serotonin. Serotonin is the chemical of significance. When you get respect, when you get invited to sit at the front of the table, when someone asks your opinion or your input, you feel, you feel respected, you feel valued, you feel significant in that moment. And when that happens, you know, you're riding shotgun in the car, that sort of a thing. You get a drip of serotonin and it feels good. What we need to understand, though, about these chemicals, these very real chemicals in our brain, is that this happens so quickly. They affect us so quickly, and they dissipate so quickly. Why is that? I mean, it comes and it goes so fast. Why is that? Well, believe it or not, and I hope this doesn't, doesn't shock you too much, but believe it or not, God did not design you for long-term happiness. God did design you for long-term habits. So every time that you get a, a short burst of this feel-good chemical, you want to repeat that behavior so that you get that feel-good chemical again. That is God's desire. So that over a long period of time, you will, you will long for, you will adapt to, you will want to build on the right things, and that you will experience this lasting joy because of these behaviors. Now, if you're tracking with me at all, you know already that Satan is very shrewd. And Satan knows how to take what God has designed for good and twist it and use it. And, and you can get the right chemicals in your brain from the wrong behavior as well. So how do you know if it's the right behavior or the wrong behavior when it feels good? Well, how do you feel the next day? So I'm, you know, if, if you've been around very long at all, you know when you feel that regret or that embarrassment, or that shame, or sorrow, what, what, what have I done? When you have, when you have done the right thing, and you get that burst of these God-given chemicals in your brain, the next day you, you don't wake up with regret, 
but a sense of, of, of pride and God, I honored you with this decision. Or this, this, is, this is your plan for my life and I followed that. On the other hand, when you haven't made the right choice and you get that burst of that, that chemical in your brain and you wake up the next morning, you, you know that feeling. So good behavior, bad behavior, you, you will feel totally different the very next day. God designed you to get these bursts of these chemicals when you make the right choices, when you do the right things. So how can we get the right chemicals and tie them to the right habits for long-term happiness? Well, if you look at, if you look at happiness and, and motivators for happiness or, or sources of happiness, if you will, there are basically three sources of happiness in life. Three sources, genetics, circumstances, and choices. Genetics, circumstances, and choices. And over the last 30 years, roughly, give or take, there's been quite a bit of research on this idea of of these sources of happiness. 50%, it is said, 50% of your happiness comes from genetics. Now, you know, some people, they're just just happier than other people, right? And they're they're just more perky. They just, they walk around with a positive outlook on life. They're just more positive, more happy than other people, and others are a little more melancholy, a little more Eeyore style than others. It's just, it's just the way that we have been. It's genetics. Genetics, they, they set us apart, and they, they kind of have this set, this set point of happiness for us based on our genetics. We're, we are designed to be happy, though. The second one, circumstances. Believe it or not, only 10% Circumstances only affects your level of happiness by about 10%. Fascinating study was done uh, comparing people who won the lottery with people who had experienced a a tragic accident that resulted in them them becoming a a paraplegic. And you want to ask, the the question asked was, well, who is happier? Well, as you might imagine, yes, after someone wins the lottery, they immediately experience a spike in happiness. And when someone experiences a, a, a tragic accident, they immediately experience a, a, a negative sense of, a, a sense of disappointment, of sadness. But the study wasn't done immediately. It was done a year later. And a year later, when people were asked both scenarios, there was relatively no difference in their level of happiness one from another. It, it's not dependent on circumstances. So here's the, the positive for you. If you're going through a struggle right now, what we need to understand is, is this, almost no singular event in our lives will affect our happiness positively or negatively for more than about 90 days. Now, I know that right now we're going on what, like 10 months of COVID, right? But no singular event will affect your level of happiness, positive or negative, by more than about 90 days. So if you are newlyweds, you have about 90 days to ride that wave, <laughs> Uh, some people say two years. I'm not so sure about that. If you lost your job, hang in there. About 90 days, and you'll start to have a positive outlook on it again. If you have had a, a, a bad breakup or just got a raise, you can ride that level for about 90 days. But this next one is so important. 40% of your happiness is based on choices that you make. of your level of happiness is based on choices. I'm not talking about choosing today to be happy, even though that is important. I am talking about a lifestyle choice. Your your happiness is heavily tied to your lifestyle choices. The habits that you develop will determine the happiness you experience. So we have the choice to be incredibly happy, but we must choose wisely. So what are the right choices, in fact? Well, we do have a couple different drivers for happiness. Now, there are, some, there are some motivations of happiness. And public motivations, this is probably no surprise to you, probably all too familiar with, but the big three, money, fame, and power. Money, fame, and power. 80% of Americans, young adults in, Americans, uh, in America said that they, they, what they want out of life is wealth. They want money, lots and lots of money. 80% of young adults in America said that's what they wanted. And another 50% added fame. So what we know about research, though, about these public motivations for happiness, this, this wealth, fame, power, well, they don't actually make you happy. We may think that they do, and on the outside it might look like they do, but they don't actually make you happy. We've all heard the saying or the idea that money cannot buy you happiness, right? Now... 
If you are living in poverty and you don't have enough money to to have food, clothing, shelter, then obviously your level of happiness will be affected by that. So there's clearly a difference between someone who makes, you know, $5,000 a year or $50,000 a year. But once your basic necessities are met, food, clothing, shelter, there is very little difference, almost no difference in the, in the, in the person who makes $50,000 a year or $50 million a year. Now, I know some of you are thinking, ah, uh, let me give that a try. But there's real, once those basic needs are met, there's relatively no difference in level of happiness. In reality, it is our, it's not the public motivations. It's the personal motivations for happiness that cause us to be the most happy. The most important one is, is first of all, relationships. Relationships with family and friends far and away are the most important factor of your happiness. Harvard University did a study, started roughly 75 years ago, and they, they handpicked 724 young men, 19 years of age at the time. Half of them were freshmen at Harvard University, and half of them lived in inner city Boston, were, but, but were, were poor. They studied these men year after year after year. They, they'd gained permission to do so, so they visited their homes, and they got their doctor's records, and they checked their blood pressure, and they looked at their jobs, and their marriage, and how many kids they had, and where they went on vacation, and, and the hobbies that they had. And year after year after year, they studied, and they asked these men, what makes you happy? What is it that, that makes you happy? And one single attribute stood out amongst everything else, strong, positive connections with family and friends. Healthy personal relationships were the driving factor in what made them happy. That's what makes you happy. That's what makes me happy. Strong, healthy personal relationships with those that we care about. Now, if you are married, this is so important. The happiest people in the study of those who were married were not necessarily those with the ha- healthiest of marriages. In fact, those who bickered from time to time and who, who fought from time to time. But at the end of the day... When nothing else mattered, at the end of the day, when they could go to sleep knowing that they could trust their partner to have their back, that is what made them the happiest. Trust is such a huge factor in relationships. They also learned from the study that loneliness is toxic to happiness. Some people desperately feel, they feel desperately lonely even though they're married. Now, I don't know where you are at, but if you're going through life right now and you feel lonely, it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, I know we say this a lot, but the reason we keep talking about small groups all throughout the year is because we are made for community. We are made to be in community with other people. We need community. And so we will continue to talk about small groups because even though you may not feel like you need that connection today, the day will come when you do. And if you are in community, you will be so much, so much better off. There is no excuse for anyone here to be lonely. The second motivation for happiness is growth. It it might be a bucket list of items, like I want to travel to this place, or I want to climb that mountain, or I want to learn a new foreign language, or I want to go and and discover a a new place, or or, uh, just a new skill, or a new ability, or a new hobby. It's, It's learning something new. All of that deals with personal growth, and personal growth, if you have sought after it, is good for your happiness. Third motivation we have is service. When you want to connect in service opportunities, it will help you, it will help you grow in happiness. Your ability to serve other people, it it helps to give you value. Wow, this this person needs some help. I have value, I have significance when I help them. So we do, we challenge you here at the church to get connected on a serve team here. Whether that is, is rocking babies in the nursery or opening the door or helping people to feel welcome or preparing communion or sharing a communion meditation or helping to clean the building from time to time or helping with our student ministry, whatever it may be, we challenge you, helping with security, whatever it may be, we challenge you to be on a serve team. Being helpful to others, again, it forms connections. It helps you to feel valued. Now, I want you to look at these words, relationships and growth and service and money, and fame, and power. And I want you to think about this for just a minute. Interestingly, it is almost impossible to to focus on and build your personal relationships if you are driven by building money and wealth. You don't have time to do both. So something will have to give. The same thing with growth. 
if you are, if you're focused on building your fame and your image, it's going to be difficult for you to also be focused on personal growth. If you're focused on power and position, it's going to be difficult for you to be mindful about serving other people. These, these tend to affect one another. You cannot, there's only so much time to do what you are called to do. Fortunately, 40%, again, of your happiness is your choice. So, what are you going to choose? Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, words from wise King Solomon, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. We have got to choose wisely. When we pursue public motivations for happiness instead of personal motivations for happiness, we will end up spending more time pleasing or trying to please other people than we will about honoring God. We will end up living pretty unhappy lives. That's not God's will. Now, all of that said, I want to get to our core verse today, Psalm chapter 1, just the first few verses. There are dozens of passages in the Bible, in Scripture, that talk about your happiness, that talk about you finding happiness. But Psalm 1, the first chapter, is, is this doorway into the world of worship. And worship of God is the starting point where we connect with our creator and we worship alongside our fellow citizens in the kingdom of God. That is you, that is me, that is other followers of Jesus Christ. When we connect in worship, it is so important to our happiness. So Psalm chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. I want to stop here for just a minute. This word blessed, if we could bring up that next slide. This word blessed, the Hebrew word, the original word is the word ashray. It means happy, praiseworthy, fortunate, lucky, blessed. That, that, I mean, these are the meanings of this word. So what I want you to understand is he's saying you're fortunate, you're lucky, you're praiseworthy, you're blessed, you're, you're happy. Happy is the one, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. The text zeroes in on healthy relationships, the people that you are building life with. Research shows what Scripture has really said all along. Your happiness starts with healthy relationships. And I want you to notice how it describes that. Walk, stand, sit. You know, as a relationship progresses, all of our relationships kind of settle over time, right? Right? And if you're in a healthy marriage, that's what you want. You want your marriage to get to a comfortable place where things are good and steady and comfortable and predictable. That's, that's what you want. The problem is, what happens if your relationship isn't healthy, isn't a good one? The longer that you are in that relationship, the more settled you will become, the harder it will be for you to stand and walk away. Young adults, I know we have a few in the room today. I know I'm a preacher and you probably expect some morality talk or that sort of thing. I just want to put it this way. If you are in a relationship that is not healthy and you have allowed that relationship to get to a settled place before you have a God-honoring commitment in place between the two of you, it will be that much more difficult for you to get up and walk away from that relationship. The more time goes by, it will be that much more difficult to do so. If you're a businessman and you are, you're starting down a business co-op or, or, or a career with someone else, a partnership with someone else, and all of a sudden you start having red flags about their business practices, get up and walk away. If you have a friend at the gym who is encouraging you to go down a path that is not God-honoring, get up and walk away. Stand up and walk away. Your relationships, the health of your relationships is the number one factor when it comes to your happiness. Verse 2. He talks about personal growth. And again, we talk about bucket list items or, or vacations or learning a new language, but I want to zero in on this word meditates or meditation, meditation of scripture. I mean, it's kind of a catch word, meditation in culture today. And I know that when I say meditation, you might be thinking, well, like, like yoga or something like that. No, I, I want to go the, the scripture direction on this. When In the Bible, when you read the word meditation, this is what David has to say about it, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Based on happiness research, 
the happiest people have the ability to get in what they call the zone. Now, if you are a competitive athlete, or you are an artist, or a musician, or uh, something along those lines, you, you have probably been in what people call the zone. I've heard that baseball pitchers will get in the zone when they step onto the mound. They, they silence the crowd. All they have is, is what's going on between them and the catcher until the ball is hit, of course, but they get into the zone. It is a focused concentration over an extended period of time, and the whole world just kind of disappears around you, and you are in the zone. If you can get in the zone with Scripture, with God's Word, you will have the ability to literally change your mind, to alter your brain. Now, if I've been informed correctly about science and the brain, we have billions of synapses that are buzzing all around. And when you have a thought and you think on that thought, two synapses connect. And the more you think on that thought, proteins will attach and they will fixate to that thought and keep it united. And so if you think on that thought for weeks or months, it will grow and be quite strong. It'll be that much more difficult to get that thought out of your mind. That's an incredible thing. Most of the time. For some of you, that might be like Pinterest going on in your mind. For some of you, it might be your business. You're fixated on your business and growing your business. For some of you, it might be your kids. For some of you, it might be some images and memories that you wish you could get out of your mind. For some of you, it's scripture. Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When you seek after the Lord, he, he will give you the outpouring of your heart. When your heart is seeking after him, that's a good thing. He will give you the delight of your heart. So if you are in a season of life where you need to build some happiness from dopamine, I'd suggest digging into Scripture. If you've never done that before, I'll give you some, uh, some specific methods here in just a little bit. Verse 3 talks about the third motivation for happiness, and that is helpful service. Helping someone else. Verses 3 and 4, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. So fruit and chaff, both are, are products, byproducts of agriculture. Both the wicked and the righteous are producing things. The righteous produce fruit, the wicked produce chaff. The fruit grows, the chaff is blown away, and all of us are busy. We're doing stuff, and some of the stuff that we are doing will last. Some of the stuff that we are doing will be blown away by the wind. So what makes the difference? Well, according to Scripture, if you, if you look at fruit throughout the Bible, you will find that fruit is helpful to someone else. It's useful to someone else. It has a purposeful, helpful use to someone else. So if you want to know if your fruit or if your life's work is fruit or chaff, all you have to do is ask the question, who is it helpful to? I mean, is, is what I'm about, is my purpose in life, is my, is my mission in life, is what I'm doing, is that helpful to someone? Now, I'm not telling you to back out of your business and go serve on a mission field or serve, serve the poor or something like that. Your business, your, 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 uh, your passion, it may be very helpful to other people that you're in business with. So if you own a business, or you're a manager at a business, you probably know this, happy people are more productive than unhappy people, right? I mean, 75% of the success of a workplace is attitude, not aptitude. On average, happy workers accomplish 31% more than unhappy workers. You're, if you're in sales, your happy salesmen sell 37% more products than unhappy salesmen. Happy doctors, don't miss this one, <laughs> happy doctors are 19% more apt to make the correct diagnosis more quickly. You want a happy doctor, okay? So the workplace, the more happy it is, or the happier the people are, the more productive it will be. So what is the difference between fruit and chaff? Fruit is helpful to other people. Chaff is only helpful to building up yourself. So you have a choice to make. You can either choose to be motivated by the public things like money, fame, power, 
or you can choose to be motivated by the personal motivations for happiness of relationship, growth, and service. But because it is a choice, there will always be consequences for our choices, won't there? Next few verses, Psalm chapter 1, 5, and 6. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. There are consequences. You know, David isn't just talking about someday, one day in the future. David is talking, in fact, about life here and now. Your life will have consequences for the choices that you make and what motivates your happiness. So if you want to make good choices this week, I'd like to offer you some, some takeaways that line up with this topic. Simple exercises. They'll just take a few minutes, a few days this week. So if you decide, you know what, I, I need, I want I'm going to choose to build into my relationships. Why don't you work on this exercise of gratitude? One simple exercise would be to decide, you know what? I'm going to write three notes of encouragement this week, uh, each day this week. So that'll be, you know, take you a few minutes every day. And you could write 15 notes of encouragement. They don't need to be long, just specific. Thanking someone for what they've done in your life, who they are to you in your life, maybe some attributes about them. Uh, you could also choose personal growth. You know what? I, I want to grow a little bit this week. So I would encourage you to meditate on scripture. A simple method is just to have a Bible reading plan. About 15 minutes a day, you can read through the entire Bible in a year. If you've never done that before and, and want some help with that, there's some, some printed copies out in the hallway. Bible reading plans. You can also use your phone. Um, whatever it takes, and you will get a dopamine burst from that as a bonus. Maybe it's service for you. Why don't you try exercising generosity? It could be generosity of time, talent, treasure. It doesn't just have to be money. It can be your efforts, that sort of a thing. So you might have to plan this out amidst your schedule, but maybe you decide, you know what, I'm, I'm going to take about five minutes a day or five dollars a day or something, and I'm going to be generous with that. Maybe you walk downtown on Main Street on a, busy, on a busy day of the week, and you just you put some extra change in some parking meters and then just walk away. Uh, someone said, I'm not sure that's legal. I think it is. I looked it up today. I don't think, I don't think it's illegal, but, but something to consider, okay? I don't think you'll get cited for it. Maybe you go through the drive through at Starbucks and you pay an additional five bucks for the car after you and say, I just want to take care of whatever they're getting behind me. Whatever it looks like, maybe you... I mean, lots of different things. You could pull your, if you live in a house or an apartment, you could pull your neighbor's trash bins in at the end of the day. Don't say anything, just do it. Find a way to be personally generous with other people. The secret to happiness is simply this. When you stack up very small but repeated good decisions, good choices, and they will become good, healthy, long-term habits, and you can develop perpetual happiness for a joyful life, that is God's design. God has designed your brain to reward you with little doses of chemicals when you do the right thing. So I'll ask again, does God want you to be happy? Oh yeah, you bet he does. But it's your choice, or in this case, choices to make. So choose wisely. Next week, we're going to be talking about the topic of money as it has to do with living your best life. Our core verse is from Matthew chapter 6. Three verses, in fact, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin will destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If you want to get a head start and maybe meditate on those verses this week, would you pray with me? God, thank you for the day. Lord, thank you that we can gather together. And Lord, we praise you for the decision that Matt is making. And uh, to be baptized tonight, and there's, there's good friends and witnesses here for that. Lord, thank you that we can worship together. Help us as we leave here to remember the, the source of happiness. It does have to do with choices that we make. Help us to be, to be motivated by good habits, good choices, that as they build on one another, it will, it will increase our happiness, our joy for life. Lord, we love you and praise you. We thank you for the good Father that you are. We know, we trust that you want us to be happy. Help us through your spirit to choose, to choose well. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
joining us. Remember to sign up for our next Starting Point class. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.